What is going on, guys? Welcome to another, the third edition of a special show for March Madness. Uh, we'll call it a lineup HQ, Grinders Live, whatever you want to call it. A little first look at the Saturday second round slate on DraftKings, mainly on DraftKings, um, March 18th. I am Eric Beinfor at Eric Beinfor on Twitter, and I am joined by our college basketball wizard, Alex Harden. Please make sure. Am I saying it. it correctly? Yeah. Okay. Al That's Alex it. Harden, fear my fear my turtle, the guy who every night when I play college basketball, uh, if I beat him, I'm going to have a good night and most often I'll lose to him and that's when I'll have a bad night. But uh, he runs the show for us here and I'm excited to kind of get a little first look and go through these eight games. The eight games is uh, much more comfortable, I think. Uh, I I'm much happier to only have eight as opposed to 15 or 16 like we've had these last couple of days. So like I said, we'll I'll pull up the uh, lineup HQ here in just a second and we'll start rolling through some of the, the tiers and give kind of a first look at these games. But uh, I did want to ask before we dive in, Alex, like, is there anything that you felt, you know, obviously we're recording at the very start of the Friday slate, but kind of through these first couple of days, anything like major takeaways, obviously we've had a couple crazy upsets and stuff, but like from a DFS perspective, anything that's really caught your eye? From a DFS perspective, it's kind of the same thing we went through last year is just having the, like the small school guys underpriced on the first few slates. And it's kind of there's a lot of mind games that go on with that when you're building like <laughs> thinking of yesterday with Teddy Allen, like I first did projections, loaded it up, put in his minutes and stuff. And like he just like pops like crazy. You're know, like this. They're playing UConn. This, this can't be right. So you do some <laughs> massaging. You go a little conservative on the minutes and you end up not playing them in your main lineups. And then he goes out and drops 50. So, I mean, but he's not going to do that every time. Like if they right. would have kept like Andre Jackson on him, most of the game, like he wasn't getting his good looks. Then he was just torching like Tyrese Martin. So it's just a lot of those situations to work through. And um, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. There's just a lot of volatility because you don't really have much information on these small school guys playing against upper tier competition. Um, so yeah, that, that's the big one that sticks out to me. Yeah. The flip side of that, right. Is like Joe Bryant, who is, his team is clearly outmatched but he's you know he's going to shoot 20 times for 5k or whatever and he he kind of got there but you know certainly yeah. wasn't a a tournament winning score and and fading him was actually you know was was pretty beneficial and so it is it is teddy teddy buckets will be a fun discussion on the on this slate which i'm sure we'll get to because the matchup is a little bit different obviously than than yukon and to your point i I went really, really hard at, uh, at at Teddy yesterday. That's just kind of how I play. You know, the the chuckers and the the high vol highly volatile guys are my kind of guys. And he was zero for six, zero for seven, something yeah, like that, with like least, yeah. with like a two with like two rebounds and a turnover in the first like nine minutes of the game. And I'm like, and I needed him, you know, like for mania and for obviously in, in my MME stuff, that was, that was like one of my big stands. And I was like, Oh God, you know, you, you know, I've, I've seen him play enough over the years where you're like, okay, this is going to be the 15 DK game. You know, he's going to shoot three for 19 and, and they're going to lose by 20 and it's going to be over. Obviously that, that didn't happen, but I think that was kind of what I was just going to add is that's like my big takeaway is Figuring out not necessarily what you think is going to happen, but what our opponents are thinking is going to happen. Right? People were pretty confident in Joe Bryant. You know, he was pretty popular uh, against it, really outmatched against Baylor. Whereas Teddy Allen was popular, but I think people were a little bit more scared of him, and so that's why I was willing to kind of embrace that. And it did not feel good for a long stretch of that game, but obviously he really turned it on and carried him to a win. And so. There's not as many of those, right? Like, like I said, we'll talk about Teddy um, in a little bit, but there's not as many of those now as we start winding down, um, you know, into less games and a lot of these mid-majors start start to get knocked off. So I have this sorted by point per dollar. Let's sort it and go start just kind of at the top here. What Let's call 8K and above. So from Agbaji all the way up, all the way up to Baycott and kind of start with the superstars. Obviously, uh, we'll get to there is one screaming value um, from an injury, oh, yeah. from an injury that uh, that we'll get to that does make that, that that makes this conversation about these studs pretty pretty darn pretty darn relevant. Was there anybody at the top, you know, between Baycott, Chet, boy, what a stinker from KJ yesterday? Any of these um, guys that stood out at first glance? Yeah, so I think Baycott stood out a little bit just because we know Baylor's a solid team, but they struggle rebounding, especially defensively. 
They allow most of their production inside. I think they're really going to miss uh, Chamua Chashua here in terms of having a body available to kind of rotate against Baycott. I mean, Flo Thamba is serviceable, but like he, he's not going to last 35 minutes inside with, with <laughs> Baycott. So, I, I mean, I, I like Baycott a lot. I don't know if he necessarily has like the nuke ceiling upside compared to someone like Chet, yeah, who I like as well. Um, he's people are talking about like if the, he can survive the NBA game in terms of physicality. Well, he's getting a test here because Memphis has NBA physicality throughout the front court. So it's really interesting here. And like <laughs> Memphis is really careless with the ball. They do a lot, a lot of turnovers. I think there's an environment for like, another like 10 combined stocks for Chet here. And if they, if Memphis pushes them, which I think they can, and you see Chet playing to the low thirties, like it, insane upside. And like thinking back to their, their game yesterday, like I would have guessed that Chet and Timmy, just by watching the game that they played like low thirties minutes, but they were actually only paid like 28 minutes each, which was surprising to me. Mm-hmm. So if you add like another full, like rotation or four or five minute time frame on that, like you can see the upside. It was it was pretty crazy watching that game. I took a decent stand on Chet, like over Baycott, and that got lucky. Um, and Baycott was absolutely going to just destroy that game yesterday against Marquette. And in the first half, like Chet was playing really well. It was basically an equal three way yeah. split between him, Timmy, and Watson. And now I don't think that they can do that against Memphis like they can against. I mean, frankly, they could barely do it against Georgia State yesterday. That was a tie game with 10 minutes left or whatever um and and chet is such a polarizing guy for me i think he's my favorite here but he feels almost like like the the teddy conversation from yesterday clearly this guy could blow up the slate he could be the guy you need to have i told i couldn't possibly agree more on like the stocks thing that's when he crushes right five blocks and four steals and a double double or whatever but this is a test this might be his biggest test from uh you know, physicality, athleticism, and everything standpoint uh, against Memphis. So I, I think you know the the Durans of the world could push him around a little bit, and I'm I'm just I'm really interested to see this game because I could yeah. see him coming out and smashing, and I could see him maybe you know like a ten and nine and two steals game where you're you know you really wanted Baycott over him. Yeah, I don't know how much game planning they do at Memphis, but if they do any, they're probably. <laughs> uh, I mean, it would probably be like just like kick his ass, like and just bang them like i'm pretty sure that's what they're going to be telling their guys to do um it's kind of a reason why we'll get into some memphis guys that seem underpriced i do have some like foul concerns on the memphis guys when we get kind of down there with like jalen duran and even deandre williams to an extent but um yeah. was, i mean this could be a really good game from a fantasy perspective and you don't necessarily yeah yeah definitely um, Tougher spot for I, Timmy too. As we as we scroll down, kind of into this this next tier, because I, I don't know about you, none of these other high end guys. I don't really like, like. Yeah, I don't like Timmy much at all in this matchup, just because like you see him get all, all of his points like within like three feet of, of the rim most of the time, and it's like backing down, finding a mouse in the house. He was doing that <laughs> constantly last game. Like, yep. I don't just he doesn't have nearly the upside as Holmgren. Like that fifty is just kind of a that that's not going to happen again this tournament in my opinion um yeah. so yeah definitely interesting up there uh, kj williams against saint peter's like i'll probably be down on him again it was a weird game for him yesterday he posted up a lot but didn't get any touches he, he almost turned himself into like a spot up three-point shooter she hit a couple but like that's not what you need from him um saint peter's does a lot of uh kind of different things defensively and i think I think it's probably not the best spot for KJ. What do you think on him? That's that's kind of what I was thinking. You know, the natural like tournament brain. I'm sure you try not to get sucked into this too much, but you're like, I loved him yesterday. I I, I didn't end up having maybe as much as I even planned on, but I thought it was just an awesome spot for him. Like I bet his props overs and everything like that. And he just totally no showed him. And I think, that, you know, people were into him too yesterday. And yeah. I feel like now we're going to back off when – like the upside is very much still there. The price is down. We have less options. There's not even like even Chet and Baycott we're talking about. We kind of like, there's still not really that many good options up here. So I'm pretty interested in him. The other guy that stood out to me moving down just a little bit is Note, JD Note. I played him yesterday actually quite a bit on my main team, even and shocker. He got into foul trouble again. Um, the muscle man auto bench strikes. God. Him. 
Yeah, and and, the and, the, and don't believe the quotes of the player. You know, he's coming out saying, like, I know I need to be smarter. I know I need to stop fouling. And then, bang, instant. Uh, he even got benched early before he committed a foul. Very weird situation. But um, I don't know exactly how many shots he took, but it was a truly absurd amount. At one point, he had, like, 18 shots in 25 minutes um, during, during that game. And... I just think that's the kind of guy, especially as these slates get smaller, the options get more limited. The matchup is not great, I understand. But uh, if a guy's going to shoot 25 times for sub 8K, you know, we know he has upside. So he was the first guy that kind of stood out to me up here. Yeah, and I probably had him a little low in terms of, of minutes. Like for a guy who commits three fouls per 40, like I've never seen someone get in so much first half foul trouble in my life on an auto bench right. team. Like maybe Musselman might think, oh, He's probably okay to play because, like, he rarely fouls out of games. But, no, that's not how Musselman thinks. Mm -hmm. You would think. Um, scrolling down a little bit, there is quite a few. I guess this is one of the first things I noticed. There's not a lot of, like, super high spins. Uh, but there's a ton of guys here, you know, from from the Viscovis of the world up to that Note range in this 7K that I don't even know if I would call them super appealing, but there's a lot of options. They all have upside, you know, on Note's team. You have Jalen Williams, who's been 8K plus for quite a while down at 7,400. All the Tennessee guys. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I love uh, Richmond here, but, you know, Jacob Gilliard's going to play 40 minutes and he's going to have the ball a lot. Um, what do you think about kind of this next tier down? Yeah, it's interesting. The Jalen Williams price tag jumped out at me. Like he, I don't think he's, really a guy who's going to get you like 45 50 very often at all but he's a really solid like 35 30 to 40 range if he plays his full minutes which i think he should um it's a decent game environment like it's just a, a pretty favorable price tag especially coming from like the ak range the last few weeks like they're gonna need him here he's gonna have to play 32 to 35 minutes and yeah uh, he's, he's he stands out quite a bit um, in terms of the Tennessee guys, I think I like uh, Triple J the most just because he's one of those guys who can get a bunch of peripherals, but, like, he also has the upside of his shot being on that day. Um, so, like, if he's hit canning threes, like, that's when he starts hitting his upside because you know it's going to do a lot around the court. Um, yeah, I, it should I be a pretty him. competitive game, yeah. He's been a moneymaker. Michigan's playing a little bit faster than I think people um... – realize like that game yesterday was actually pretty crazy um and their defense is not nearly but there's there's this weird thing with these teams with bigs right hunter dickinson like you can't score on him in the post he obviously is a good rim protector they have some decent perimeter defenders but their defense is pretty horrible because you just have this big guy sit playing drop coverage so guys are just getting open the pick and roll is obviously and you know and then you get into a scramble off the yeah. pick and roll it just creates so much and tennessee has four guards that can all make things happen um, against that defense. So Triple J is definitely the guy uh, for me. I agree. I also think um, a guy like him, what's been interesting with Tennessee is they didn't really push those guys minutes wise during like the part of the SEC run. Like he'd get like 30 to 32. A lot of times he'd come out, you know, he also gets in foul trouble a little bit, but he would come out fairly early um, in the second half and maybe play 15 minutes. And he's been in these must win games pushing like you have, you know, 35 here. If he doesn't get in foul trouble, he's definitely like that's there. He's not really going under that. He's, if anything, he might go over that. So there's a little juice left to squeeze on that compared to like, we'll get to Teddy Allen here in a second. Right. You put him at 38 because you have to, because if it's close and he's not in foul trouble, he's going to be out there. But there's not like any real juice left to squeeze on that from a minutes perspective. Yeah, definitely. Once Olivier Nakamwa went down in like February for Tennessee, that opened up the Triple J like 38, 39 minute uh, minute ceiling when needed. And if this is one of those scenarios, like like you said, there's a lot more juice on that on that projection. So, Teddy, we, let's talk about Teddy because he's going to be maybe the talking point of the slate. Right. And I, I, I assume everyone's probably just going to play him. But is there is there any reason to come off of him at this? at this price, you know, at this probably what highest ownership of the slate, sec maybe second highest. It's, it's tough just because he's quite a bit underpriced. Like you, I was kind of hoping he'd be like 8,500 or 9k or something. Mm -hmm. It's play probably just going to have to eat um, in terms of like anything I'm putting like thought into hand building or anything like that. It's just, it's probably, it's a better game environment, obviously. <laughs> Arkansas is 
has some a decent defensive efficiency and, and some de- decent defensive players, but they play really fast. So it kind of negates some of that. Um, like you said, Teddy's going to play as, as long as he can keep himself on the floor without doing something insane. Um, and he's going to take a lot of shots. He just has high rebound rate, assist rate. He's going to be involved. You, you don't have, you're not worrying about him like disappearing. Like he's going to win them the game or lose them the game. As at least, you know, the guy that you're paying for, it's going to be on his shoulders. You can't say that for everybody in college the, basketball DFS. And there's not that many actually on this slate. You know, th- there's quite a few this Friday. We're doing it again, recording this on a Friday. There's a lot of those guys yeah, on this Friday yeah. slate. T- tomorrow on this Saturday slate that we're talking about, there kind of isn't. Like, look down this list. Like, Baylor, I mean, kind of a Kinjo, but it's it's fairly spread out. Creighton, pff, I, I, I guess Hawkins now without Cockbrenner, but who knows? That, you know, that can't, they're going to be a disaster. We'll get to that exa- in a minute, I guess. Yeah, and, and, and you know, Kansas is spread out. Remy's back, like uh, apparently Arizona State Remy, uh, preseason Big 12 Player of the Year Remy is there. You know, look down this list. It's like you pick a team out where it's one guy that is going to, you know, carry yeah. the load um, and play every minute. There really isn't any. So I, I don't really think that I can, I can fade him. Is there anybody – Kind of now we're going to get into like, you know, six to seven K ish range. Um, I felt like not again today, this Friday slate is very different because everybody in that range is like, you know, all the best players on every mid major in the, in the country. Whereas on this slate, it's like these secondary players from the good teams, right? Like Jules Bernard, Amudier, (sighs) RJ Davis, Strother, right? It's kind of like these secondary guys that I struggle with. I guess Hawkins would be the guy that pops out to me here. And and you mentioned Duran. Um, do you have any kind of like different take or was there anybody that caught your eye? No, this is like the most difficult part of going through this slate is kind of dissecting that mid range because there isn't really anything that stands out. Like, uh, are you going to get good Amude or are you going to get like ghost Amude? (laughs) Like it was okay if he's like 5,300, but he's 62 here. Um, Duran, like I feel good about him if he can stay on the floor for like 26 plus minutes, but I have some concerns there. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Hawkins. Like, I don't know how many players Creighton can, can lose before they start actually losing games. Um, (laughs) It's kind of ridiculous that they're even at to this point. Um, Like they have no true like point guard. Now they're down their starting center. Like, and now they're playing like arguably like the hottest team in college basketball. It's going to be tough for them, but I mean, he's going to have to play the whole game yep. and it's only 6,500. Yeah. He, he was, I guess, kind of the guy that I'm not I, I, pivoting a little bit. Juzang is a guy I see people keep going, keep going back to. And uh, I, I don't imagine that they will against St. Mary's, but I'm kind of hoping that they do because that uh, UCLA team is it's, I guess it's just Hawkes' team now, and uh, Juzang is just going to take a back seat. But nothing super appealing, and they're kind of all, again, in this range, right? Bernard, Tiger, Hawkes is a little more expensive, but all the UCLA guys are there. And again, spread out. You tell me who's going to who's gonna pop up there. I'm trying to – the Providence guys, any, any interest in the Providence guys? They have one of the, I guess, good matchups. But again, it's a little bit more of a difficult – Nate Watson is, I guess, just not a thing. He's Ed Croswell's backup now, I guess. Yeah, I mean, Nate Watson has, like, the shortest leash in college basketball for someone who thought uh, he was going to be really good in, in DFS this year. It, it It's the challenge. I, Al Durham's price is decent. And you talk about, like, minutes upside. We have him at 31. He could play into the mid-30s. I mean, his projection is not great, but um, I could see him catching fire a bit. I know people like playing, like, Jared Bynum in tournaments for a while, but if – if they have the full complement of their backcourt, like I don't necessarily see him getting enough minutes to be able to go off. Um, it's a tough range, really. The yeah, like the Baylor guys, you just one of them might do well, but there's really no indicators on on who. Um, and if they go um, like like Baylor, if they my favorite lineup for Baylor is when they play like Sohan at the five and go small. I'm not sure yeah. how much they're going to be able to do that against Baycott. Yeah, that's a really good point. I was I was gonna say because some of the, there's probably someone that's gonna pop up right from Baylor because they are a little bit undermanned and UNC is a great matchup, but it's a tricky one, right? So, Han, I, I I think that would be my favorite guy. 
Um, how many minutes did like Matthew Meyer play play yesterday? Did, he played twenty six, I think, for like the fifth straight game. Because now they they did like he's interesting to me because we know he's productive. We know he's not he's not afraid to to shoot even like last year when he's like the fifth best player on the team with the highest usage rate. I, I think he's I, I, now as we're talking through it, I think he's a fairly intriguing guy to me in, in tournaments because he can play in all those different lineups. Oh, geez. 67. I thought that was 57. So even now, even then, I don't know that I can play him at 6,700, but we're saying that about everybody. So we, we do yeah. have to pick some players eventually. Why do you think they haven't pushed his minutes like ever this year? He has not played 30 minutes once this, this year. I don't get I, it. I, I really don't get it. I was expecting him to be like a 32 minute a game guy coming in this year. And he doesn't even sniff that. It's and odd. so I, I, I do think though, as we get into these tough games, and I, I, I'm not sure that it's going to be tough for them against Carolina, but like, as we get into these tougher games without Cryer, right. Without everyday John, they are running thin on good bodies. And like, you never know, maybe foul trouble pops up on somebody and you get lucky and you do get the 34 minute Meyer game or the, you know, Kendall Brown figures out how to play basketball again. Like, I, you know, I, I don't know who it is, but I do feel like there's maybe some juice to squeeze from Baylor just because there's not a lot of good matchups on this. There really isn't a lot of good matchups yeah. on this slate. So um, I'm trying to kind of think about that a little bit more. Let me go back to this salary range, see if there's anything that pops out that we missed and we can get into some of the more value guys. And Defo, I guess, is a reasonable price at 6,800. You know, obviously he got in miserable foul trouble against Oscar yesterday, and he does get KJ, but I guess there's a little bit of upside. McCormick, uh, I guess, talk about Kansas a little bit, because they're all lumped in this tier too, right? McCormick and Jalen Wilson, Agbaji's a little bit more expensive. Um, do any of those guys stick out to you with Kalkbrenner gone? You know, he's kind of the everything for Creighton's defense. He's what makes their defense go with the rim protection. Do you think there's anything to be had um, from Kansas? Yeah, almost certainly we'll have a GPP tag on McCormick. Um, <laughs> How many times have you done that Done that this year? Too many. Like, too many. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I I don't necessarily get the, like, the minutes. Like, he was being rested in the Big uh, 12 yeah. tournament. Like, this is the Big 12 tournament. Why are you playing him, like – 10 and 12 minutes, but he played 29 versus Texas tech in the championship played 23 lat yesterday in a blowout. Like if, if he's someone getting like mid twenties minutes against a caulk Brennerless Creighton, like I could see him do his, one of his go for his, one of his like 35, 40 point fantasy games. Um, so he's kind of interesting to me. Uh, Jalen Wilson. He didn't play much at all yesterday. Oh, uh, he had foul trouble and only 20 minutes and they were up by a lot. So he might be someone who goes kind of a bit overlooked just because he had a poor box score. Like he's one of their main guys. He's finally out of the doghouse. It looks like for good. And he's been playing pretty stable minutes. So um, yeah, I wouldn't play him and McCormick in the same lineup. Obviously. Yeah. I think Wilson is always intriguing to me for tournaments because you, you really never know. And it, they could do it tomorrow against Creighton without Cockbrenner and just go to their small ball lineup where he's essentially the five. Um, yeah. which gives him, uh, you know, just a ton, a ton more upside. Um, you, who the hell knows when that's going to, you know, it, Kansas is very difficult to predict, especially with Remy back, who I did want to bring up as we're kind of getting into that price tier. Anyway, you know, Remy crushed again yesterday, and I had pretty severe concerns that the minutes were like a real thing. But do you think that this is something maybe, you know, on a slate that is lacking a little bit more for plays? Is is Remy, do we want to chase this Remy thing or or what do you think about him? I think if if he's going to be high owned, like if he's pushing 25, 30, 35 percent, like he's probably someone I don't want any of versus Creighton. But if he's someone that's going to go overlooked and people are just playing the projections and he's under 10 mm -hmm. percent, he's someone that I do have interest in. It's just one of those scenarios where like um, he's he's not going to be starting like it's pretty clear he's going to he's going to be like the super sub bench role. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have upside. He can certainly come out and drop 30 points and, and be fine. Um, and he's looked a lot better the last couple games. Um, and if there's any indication, like his minutes were pushed against Texas Tech in a, in a close game, this could be that kind of game. On the other hand, without Kalkbrenner, it's much less likely to kind of come down to the wire. So I'm, I'm kind of just riding the fence and want to see where people land on him, which might be a bit difficult to gauge. 
But yeah. with this projection being like under 4x on this slate, like I would expect him to be relatively low owned now that he's over 5k. Um, he's a decision I kind of I was going back and forth on a hundred times yesterday and ultimately ended up not playing him. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure what was the right side there, but yeah, it's definitely a sticking point on, on all these slates. Yeah. And it was a little difficult yesterday because there wasn't much value to be, to be had down there. And so that's what just got me to take a couple darts on him, but I didn't feel very good about it where maybe some of this just going to, deviate from our our original plan of of going by by tiers because we're starting to get into the value stuff and i think this team is where the value is where probably the biggest chunk of the value on the slate comes from which feels pretty gross on a a what is probably going to be a bad team against kansas but for anyone that didn't see ryan cockbrenner got hurt yesterday they haven't said what it is but it looked like an acl or, or something to me um definitely a serious injury there's no way he plays and and we already have an already shorthanded Creighton team without Ryan Nemhard. But a lot of good projections here relative to to the slate. Obviously, Keyshawn Faisal. I don't I don't know if that's how how you say it. Is uh, basically his his direct backup came in and played what six minutes or something yesterday after Cockbrenner got hurt. Um, not much, not going to say much about him. He's three thousand dollars. You're probably just going to be playing him uh, and dealing with the the variance, kind of like Frankie Collins yesterday. But after him, what are you kind of thinking? How are you processing? We talked a little about Hawkins, but how are you kind of processing these other guys? Yeah, it's it's tough because you're almost like just playing them because they're going to be out there the whole game and you need to <laughs> fill out your roster, which is probably not a good reason to play somebody. Um, <laughs> however, and in, in like, like you probably don't have to worry about saying like you'll be playing too much Creighton if you play one of these guys because you already have Fizel. Well, everyone's probably going to have him. Um, I do have some a lot of foul concerns on him. He was like a 5.8 per 40 foul guy. However, Jeez. a lot of times with that, like he's a bench guy who knows he's only going to play like seven or 10 minutes and he'll just go out there and, and hack. But I'm not well versed in his game to know if that's just like <laughs> something he was doing or if that's just how he's going to play on, on an extended stretch. But 3K, he's going to have to start. Be interesting to see if, if uh, Kansas does play Jalen Wilson at the five, if they – kind of go small and play like the the ratty guy more than mm-hmm. Fizel. So I'm going to have to think through that on the projection. The minutes might come down for Fizel, but regardless, he's still going to be kind of a smash value at, at 3K flat. Um, I beyond think, that, I think, I think – yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask about those about the guards between – well, Kaluma's not really a guard, but between Alexander, O'Connell, and Kaluma, you know, if somebody doesn't want Hawkins, is it, what would be your preference between those guys? I mean, in tournaments, I think it's O'Connell is the guy that you want because he's shown like a a big ceiling out of nowhere if he gets the three ball going. So, you know, if you're playing him, you're playing a variance game that he'll get that he'll catch fire. Um, And he's probably not a guy that you'll need a ton of to kind of be over the field um, just because like he doesn't have good baseline numbers, but he does have like steel and three point upside. And there's plenty more shots to go around without Kalkbrenner, who's about like a 20 percent usage guy. Um, Fizel is pretty low usage, so that that frees up a bit more shot opportunities for everyone else in the lineup. I think Hawkins is probably the safest of those mid-range Creighton guys, just because he has some like rebound floor, um, and he is a really low foul rate guy. He's like under two fouls per forty, meaning that like if Fizel does get in foul trouble and he plays the five, like he's just going to be on the floor no matter what. Um, they'll need him to be on. Um, yeah. Do you have any other any? kind of opposing thoughts on Creighton? I don't, I don't think so. I think Trey Alexander, I guess, is is the other guy that we didn't really talk about. And, well, and, and, and Kaluma. It, it's such a fascinating thing. It's like Trey Alexander was their best player yesterday in that game. I'm not going to say he won them that game, but he, he was the leading scorer in that game. He got in foul trouble and still led the team in scoring. He seems to me, I'm not, uh, you know, don't, quote me on all my college basketball takes, you know, getting my, my hand on the court, but he really looks to be getting a lot better to me. I thought when, when Nemhard went down, he looked lost. He looked (laughs) like he was not ready to play big time division one college basketball. And I don't know what's happened uh, recently just by my untrained eye. He looks much more comfortable. I mean, to go out and in 29 minutes, get 18, five and four with a couple of steals, shoot 50% against San Diego state in a must win game. I I thought that that was pretty impressive. I don't think he's going to be scared of 
of of Kansas. So that's kind of my the, the you know if he's going to be much more popular than O'Connell, uh, I'll put my GPP bro hat on for sure. But um, if if people are going to be like, yeah, you know, it's just Trey Alexander and he comes in at reasonable ownership, I think I think he's my favorite. Um, just because I really hate playing Kaluma. I don't know why. I just really don't like. Don't, don't don't really like playing Kaluma. He just he shoots, but he doesn't. Sometimes he pops up for peripherals, but it's very well, random. He just has like a glass ceiling of like twenty eight. Like yeah, if he if he gets to like eighteen in the first half, like you know he's finishing with twenty six. If he gets eight, <laughs> if he gets eight in the first half, like you know he's going to work his way to like twenty two. It's just like kind of a lose lose with him, but like he does have a semblance of stability. But to your point on Alexander, I think that's definitely true. Like he was a a four-star recruit had a lot of high-end D1 offers like McDermott's a pretty good coach and like developer and you can definitely see he's built up his uh, confidence a bit like in the post-game interview you could see that there was some kind of connection there I know we're getting a bit like narratively with that but you can certainly see like McDermott is proud of his progression as a player and like you can see he's like a confident to be out there and not just running around clueless like he had been earlier in the year. Right. And like you said, we're getting a little bit narrative, but I do kind of think Creighton is like, it's a big, you, we, you have to figure out Creighton because there's not a lot of value. There's not, um, there's honestly not a lot of good plays on the slate. And you have one team that's missing what maybe their two most important players now um, on the season. And they're all reasonably priced. Kansas's defense is fine, but I'm not like, I don't back down from the Kansas playing guys against Kansas. So um, the one guy I didn't get a chance to look at his price was Frankie Collins. Is Devonte you got, so you have Devonte Jones for twenty eight minutes? I haven't read anything. Um, yeah, talk about that situation. He's back with the team. He was clear. Okay. He traveled. He's practicing. Um, I fully expect him to start. Like it's a situation okay. where like Frankie might have earned him a couple more bench minutes, but to me, going to be kind of avoiding that. Like, I mean, might be able to get Devonte Jones pretty low owned, and like he was a guy coming on strong at the end of the year. You just you never know especially with like a concussion, like if they're yeah. going to take it easy on him, or if he's completely full go, but he's at least somewhat interesting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and as we wrap up here and just go by point per dollar and just run through super, super quickly. And maybe we can touch on anybody we didn't, we didn't talk about. Obviously Faisal at the top. Don't really have to talk about that too much. Teddy Allen, Ryan Hawkins, you mentioned a Moutier, but what you did also kind of talk about DeAndre Williams, I guess, is there, you know, Memphis is, I guess, one of the more appealing spots. I mean, Georgia state guys perform well yesterday. The tempo in that game is going to be absolutely nuts, even though both teams are good defensively. Memphis is a team. I absolutely hate playing uh, um, because, yeah, of, too. you know, they're, they're a nightmare, but um, uh, is there anybody DeAndre, is he kind of your preference Duran, or is there anybody else? It's probably those two, and I foul concerns with both of them. Like, they're both probably around, like, a 5 per 40. Like, I might be getting a little aggressive with uh, DeAndre's minutes. Eh, that's probably about right. But, I mean, you know, you know I, playing Memphis is not comfortable. Um, Lomax is interesting, too. He's been playing a lot of minutes. Um, he had a terrible match. I think he played pretty well yesterday in a what was a pretty bad, like, micro and matchup for him so he's kind of interesting as well he's been playing pretty big minutes it's just like you, you never you never really know with with memphis but it seems like they're not like the full-blown like 12-man memphis rotation of mm-hmm. like early conference season play yeah which is which is good the other thing i i do like just to start to wrap up from like a macro perspective we kind of talked about it with like a triple j or tennessee or whatever where you, you have to put some logic into the minutes projections, right? You can't just put everybody at 38 or 39 there, you know, and, and it also has to be reasonable, but these got, when we get to the tournament, right? Jacob Gilliard is capped out at 40. He's played for his projection is based on, he's played 40 for like a month in every single yeah. game. He never leaves the floor, right? He's a Saint, he's like St. Bonaventure guys. These guys, we don't really know exactly how it's going to play out. But when you get into these games, like if Devondre, if Deandre Williams plays well, maybe he does play 36 minutes and all of a sudden he's the best play of the slate just because that's how it goes in Mar- you know, in the tournament. Sometimes it, it, they don't run their regular season rotations and we're already starting to see that with Memphis. So I think Memphis is kind of like the low key, maybe the key to the, to the slate. I could end up totally wrong when we get the 12 man penny rotation again, but I think against Gonzaga, I think he might tighten it up a little bit more. 
And uh, especially, you know, if you get Duran foul trouble, Dandridge probably gets in foul trouble after coming in, coming in for Duran. You know, he only ha- he only does have so many bodies. Um, yeah. I guess they got Amani back, which was that, really, hilarious. really weird. <laughs> <laughs> like he must have some like uh, guarantee in his contract if they make a the tournament, he can see the floor. Yeah, and he hits a three. I, I was <laughs> watching. I had it on like a side screen, and like, I'm like, who? Is that a mock? Like he just comes onto the floor, chucks in the first five seconds, yeah. hits a three. You know, he's 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 hasn't played in months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was absolutely hilarious. Um, just gonna look really quick. I don't think that there's anything that we missed. I guess Daryl, Dar- the St. Peter's guys could possibly be some value. I, that makes me re- really uncomfortable, but they're cheap as well. If we if we need it, um, and I think that that's really about it. I guess we can wrap up with any. What's your like first initial like? Okay, I feel really strong about this thing on the slate. If there, if there, if there is anything. Oh man, let me pull up. I, I mean, I feel strongly that like Fizel and Allen are gonna just be like ultra like insane chalk. Like we're talking, especially when we cut down the games from sixteen to eight. It, we were getting the sixteen game slate. We had guys pushing 40 45 yeah. percent ownership in like the hundred k GPP. So like. I'd be shocked if Teddy was anything under like 55, 60% and like even the largest stuff. Um, Fizel might go a little bit under the radar just because that was a late injury. There's nothing really indicating in terms of like box scores that he would be the direct replacement or anything like that. Um, I mean, those are really the only things I, I feel good about. I, I, I feel good that you're going to need one of the Chet Baycott okay. range guys in your lineup. I like that. Just because like of the, the upside that they're going to provide. So like, I guess my take is I feel very comfortable that one of those two are going to be um, in the tournament winning lineup. I like it. My, my, uh, my hot take was going to be, I can't envision a scenario. I, this is kind of what I said with, uh, with Peter kiss in the, uh, in the first four, right. Grand stage, fun environment. And on each side, there's like, alphas right i can't imagine peter kiss coming out on the national stage on a, and not just like chucking right like you knew yeah. we were going to get 20 something shots so like i'm just taking his overs and, and playing him in dfs and you deal with it that's how i feel about teddy against jd note as long as note <laughs> cannot as long as note cannot get handsy those guys may never pass the ball you will not <laughs> outshoot me you will not do that's- it that's what if both Teddy, of them are saying. Yeah, exactly. So if Teddy gets hot, right, and everybody's going to play Teddy anyway, and everybody might, and maybe Note, maybe you know Note isn't sneaky or anything, but like how I'm envisioning JD Note being like, well, I'm not getting trumped by by Teddy, you know, especially if it's close, whatever. Um, so that's kind of my takeaway is I think that those two guys, you know, it makes perfect correlation like sense just in general, and I think we get a kind of a shootout from the, now. They might both shoot three for twenty five, but it's not going to be for lack of effort. So um, that'll do it uh, for the Saturday. First Saturday slate, we'll be back again. Is it you and I again tomorrow? Yeah, I think it's us two tomorrow and then next week for the Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. We'll have the next uh, three college basketball tournament slates covered. So Perfect. And if you are not in the Discord for college basketball, uh, it's a must if you're playing, especially in tournament time now where – you know, we don't always get lineups in time. So if you have questions about how, you know, especially we get Creighton situations and stuff, the RG Discord and go to the college basketball channel. Uh, it's an it's an absolute must. And obviously we're looking at the projections here that Alex does. Uh, John Schiller, Varnkis puts out an article every single day, breaking down every single game and every single fantasy relevant player with specifics on matchups and tournament takes and everything. So we have everything that you need. Uh, with the college basketball product. And like I said, we'll be back with these shows uh, for the next several slates. Um, But that'll do it for me, Eric. And for here, my turtle, we will be back tomorrow and we'll see you guys later.